Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Nichols. I'm the Science and Technology Advisor for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. And we would like to welcome you to our webinar today, um, updating you on our findings of the state-of-the-art report we did for uses of nanotechnology on surfaces and military applications. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy days to join us. Uh, just a few housekeeping measures here before we get started. Uh, we just want to let you know that we will be recording this presentation. Uh, if you would like to download a copy of this recording and corresponding documents, they will be available uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn by this time tomorrow. Uh, we will also have uh, some additional documents, the state-of-the-art report itself, uh, this presentation, and some other documents about HDIAC available for download at the end of this webinar. Uh, but don't feel panicked if you're not able to download those today. Like I said, we will have those available for download by this time tomorrow. Uh, one more thing, uh, we do have the chat function enabled at any time. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to use that function. Um, as we progress through the slides, I will try to uh, get to any questions we have um, after I finish the slide before we move on to the next one. Uh, but we'll also have some time at the end of the webinar uh, to take some questions and if, um, you know, you're not able to get your questions answered today or you would like to contact me directly, uh, we will have my uh, contact information up um, at the end of this webinar so that you're able to reach out to me uh, directly. So once again, um, this is our update on our findings of the State of the Art Reports. And I am Greg Nichols, Science and Technology Advisor for HDIAC. So first, we're just going to give you an overview of um, how we got to this point, briefly discuss uh, the background of the state-of-the-art reports in HDIAC, who we are, what we do, talk a little bit about nanotechnology in the Department of Defense, uh, talk about the methodology we use for this report, talk about the trends that we found, and then also um, kind of give you a brief summary of everything. Uh, a few things I do want to mention, uh, we, are, we won't cover a lot of the really heavy science and engineering. We're just going to touch on the findings um, and the summary of, of what we discovered in this report. So this won't be a dip, deep dive. If you have any, you know, really heavy technical questions about nanotechnology or engineering or, or material science, again, feel free to reach out to me using the contact information that we provide at the end of the webinar. Um, we're going to mainly just focus on uh, what came out of this report and talk about some of the directions that we see that may be applicable to the defense community. So the Homeland Defense Security Information Analysis Center uh, is a DOD-sponsored organization. Um, administratively, we report to the Defense Technical Information Center. And organizationally, we actually sit within the Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, Research and Engineering. And what we do is we uh, utilize expertise and knowledge from a variety of different government agencies, institutions, laboratories, industry, and academia uh, to help solve and facilitate research um, with the government's uh, most difficult challenges. And so each year we are tasked to develop two state-of-the-art reports. And these reports focus on um, you know, pressing areas of concern or, or areas of interest within the defense community. Um, and so this one specifically comes from our 2016 batch. Um, this is concerning nanotechnology and uses of nanomaterials um, to manipulate surfaces. And the reason that we picked this is because nanotechnology has been a big interest to DOD um, you know, since before 2000, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but really, it's, it's about the, the fact that the surface is one of the most fundamental aspects of an object. And once you can modify the surface of anything, you can actually get it to respond differently and adaptively to its environment. So understanding how we can use nanotechnology to create these new types of interactions between objects and their environments, um, and specifically for defense applications, is of a primary concern and has been uh, to the defense community. So Department of Defense has been interested in nanotechnology for many years now. Um, in 2000, the United States launched the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which was the uh, national uh, research and development uh, program to promote nanotechnology innovation within the United States. And there have been many different government agencies involved in that. Department of Defense was one of the first 
uh, to actually be engaged. And even before 2000, Department of Defense has been very active in nanotechnology research. Now, in FY17 alone, Department of Defense, through the National Nanotechnology Initiative, has um, been budgeted about $131 million for nanotechnology-related research. Uh, there are other funding mechanisms uh, within different parts of DOD um, outside of the National Nanotechnology Initiative that also supports um, nanomaterial research, but specifically through the NNI, it's about $131 million. But as you can see from the uh, chart we have on the screen here, uh, these are the different agencies within DOD who do receive um, nanotechnology funding from the NNI. Um, the organizations that are um, in the black text are the ones that specifically get the money and then they distribute it down through their um, lower commands. And so there are eight main organizations. Uh, we have the, the ones in blue are listed. Those are the parent organizations that get the money and then funnel it down to the uh, their respective um, organizations. So one thing about um, HDIAC is we actually cover research and development and information sharing within a very specific set of focus areas. And there are eight different focus areas that we cover. And these are the eight that we are responsible for. And when we approach this report, we wanted to look at how exactly does nanotechnology in terms of how it can be used for uh, changing surface interaction uh, fit within our focus areas. And so this is how it breaks down. Now, just kind of a point of um, discussion, we don't necessarily touch on each and every one of these in the report, and that's for a few different reasons. Um, and we'll talk about the methodology on the next slide, but we wanted to focus on developments in nanotechnology that um, could be commercialized within the next one to two years, and, and things that were somewhat practical could actually be used by the Department of Defense. Uh, we're not looking at things that are very far out, things that are, you know, five and 10 years away wasn't the focus of this report. So that's why some of these things are listed, but we didn't necessarily talk about them. So here is the methodology we followed to develop the report. So we have three different areas that we focused on. So first, we uh, conducted an extensive literature search and review. Uh, these are the keywords that we selected. Um, obviously, you could see that we got quite a few articles. So we had over 1,000 articles initially. And then we worked with subject matter experts and also looked at trends within Department of Defense um, and had some other caveats that we used to narrow that down. So we were focusing on methods and products that have been used and developed within the past three years. So we conducted this search in 2016. I think we went back as far as 2013. Uh, we also looked at research that could be commercialized within the next one to two years, as I mentioned previously. Uh, so that helped us narrow and you know, focus us down a little bit more. So those 1,200 articles um, probably got co compacted down to maybe three or 400. Um, and then in the report, even though we, we had some of these uh, well-defined uh, barriers, we did occasionally discuss other trends that could be further out, maybe five years or so, because we wanted to show how today's research and today's state-of-the-art technology uh, is actually setting up some of these future developments that we will probably see. And towards the end of the webinar, I'll uh, give you some of those kind of up and coming things that we see. We also reviewed websites of 16 relevant institutions that are conducting nanotechnology research. Some are within the Department of Defense, some are within other federal agencies, and some are with universities that have major government funding. And finally, we collaborated with one of our partners, ORU, they are a um, um, university consortium located here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, we reached out to their university partnerships office um, to help solicit some information from some of their universities conducting research in this area. Uh, we actually had a, a pretty small um, amount of feedback from them with about six universities responding. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the research that we found later on. So overall, what we found is we were kind of going through the literature search and looking at uh, some of these other websites and some of the other university research is that 
the use of nanotechnology and surface modifications fell out nicely into three categories. So the first one um, were areas of applications focusing on hard surfaces. So we're talking about non, the non-pliable outer portion of an object, and specifically things like uh, aircraft, vehicle, ships, um, those sorts of things. So sometimes we're talking about um, you know, changing the, the patterns of the surface itself or maybe the immediate substrate of, of a hard material. Uh, the next category that we found were the soft surfaces. These are things that are pliable, mainly consistent with uh, the coverings of textiles. And then finally, the non-durable goods. These are things that have short shelf lives or they require a significant amount of maintenance. Uh, some of these you know, were coatings and as we go through the report, you'll see that we also had some coatings mentioned in the soft surfaces. But the reason we took these coatings and the non durable goods into a different category is because they just require so much work um, and sometimes many multiple applications throughout the year or they just don't last very long that we thought it probably needed to be in its own category. So overall, really what we found was that there was a very broad use and development of nanoceramics and a variety of applications, and we'll discuss what those are um, in the next few slides. We also have seen um, a very consistent use and an increase in silver, copper, titanium dioxide, and zinc oxides in a variety of applications. And you'll see that silver, titanium dioxide, um, and to some degree zinc oxide continue to be some of the um, key nanomaterials used in most coatings. And then finally, we've seen um, an increase in the use of carbon nanotubes, uh, particularly in textiles. But what's interesting is that we didn't really find any trends to where carbon nanotubes are being used to make um, fabrics on a large scale themselves. They're often being used um, as an incorporation into other existing types of um, fibers like polyester and Kevlar. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, especially when we get to the body armor portion. Within the hard surfaces, um, we've seen advancements in nanoceramics because of their mechanical, electrical, magnetic properties. And we've also seen um, kind of a trend of making surfaces uh, patterned so that they become super hydrophobic. And the super hydrophobic uh, surface is one that has a water contact angle of 150 degrees or greater. So the, the water beats up on the surface. And you can use coatings for that, which we have seen in some of the other areas we'll get to. Uh, but specifically for the hard surfaces, we're talking about changing the pattern or the texture of the surface itself. In the soft surfaces, we've seen major advancements in antibacterial coatings. Um, specifically, I think silver still remains uh, the key material there, and we have a whole ser um, section where we'll talk about soft services. We've also seen uh, some major developments in smart textiles, uh, which are uh, fabrics that respond to an environment based on a uh, set of stimuli. And then we also have seen, as I mentioned, with the carbon nanotubes, an incorporation of some of these nanomaterials into existing fibers. And in some cases, we've actually seen nanomaterials being grown on fibers themselves, which is a very interesting development. In the non-durable goods, um, we've seen some advancements in um, anti-corrosive coatings using nanomaterials to enhance epoxy coatings, and then also within biomedical applications, uh, particularly on wound dressings, we've seen an increase in silver nano coatings as well as um, some other nanoscale biomaterials. So we're going to move on and we're going to dive a little bit um, deeper into each of these different categories and talk about the trends that we have found, give you some more information. Uh, so the, the first three slides are going to be our results of the literature search, and we'll start with the hard surfaces first. So as I mentioned, we have seen a um, big increase in the use of nanoceramics. And uh, nanoceramics are just nanoscale version of ceramics, but um, ceramics are typically inorganic, non-metallic, and solid. They can have a variety of different types of metals and metal, metal oxides and metal weights incorporated into them, but um, the ceramic itself on a whole is inorganic, non-metallic, and solid. So some of the applications we have seen um, for Nanoceramics on the hard surfaces are abrasion-resistant coatings and applications. We've also seen 
Um, an increase in the use of copper oxide based nanoceramics as superconductors. Now, I do want to make a point here that uh, superconductivity is not necessarily specific to a nanoscale material itself. Um, copper, on some conditions, can be a superconductor, but that combination of the copper within a ceramic um, has been used as a superconductive material. We've also seen um, iron oxide nanoceramics for use as um, filtration systems to remove heavy metals from wastewater. And we've also seen hydroxyapatite, which, a, which is a biomaterial that's one of the primary components of bone. We've seen that used to improve biocompatibility of um, orthopedic implants um, that are used within surgical um, procedures. Moving on to the superhydrophobic surfaces, as I mentioned before, there are coatings that can be super hydrophobic, and we'll talk about that on the next couple slides. But here we're specifically talking about how we can manipulate the surface of um, something like a ceramic or something like a metal to make it super hydrophobic. And, and we do this with a variety of different techniques, but we're talking about making texture patterns. One of the most common ways to do this is taking nanoscale materials that look like small columns and making hair-like projections on the surface. Um, and that space between the surface and the top of the nanomaterial column, if you will, is what creates that pattern surface. And that's what makes an object, in this particular case, super hydrophobic. So the water droplets will beat up because that uh, water contact angle is greater than 150 degrees. And some of the other applications that we have seen on hard surfaces have been the use of uh, zinc oxide and carbon nanotubes and gas sensing. Uh, carbon nanotubes make very good sensors because they're very good electrical conductors, so they've been um, quite useful. Um, some of the manufacturing processes aren't quite to scale yet. They're rather expensive when you get out of that research environment to large-scale production, but uh, some of the trends we have seen have definitely been in using carbon nanotubes for sensors. Uh, we've seen some use with um, yttrium iron garnet films and other kinds of dope versions in uh, a variety of magneto-optical applications. Specifically in here, we've seen them used as modulators, um, sensors for high voltage network testing, and also uh, telemetry. So moving on to the next category, we um, evaluated the use of nanomaterials and soft surfaces. And we, we have a variety of different applications here. So. First of all, I want to talk about functionalizing uh, nanomaterials so that they can actually be applied as coatings. And this is probably one of the most important distinctions between the soft surfaces and the hard surfaces. On uh, things like fibers, we're not actually manipulating the surface. We are having another nanomaterial adhere to a fiber, um, or in some cases, actually growing a nanomaterial um, fiber onto a larger fiber. And so some of the most common methods we've seen um, in this report on functionalization are um, using the solid gel coating methods. We've seen physical vapor deposition, and we've also seen the use of electrospinning. Um, now, I think electrospinning is worth mentioning. It's, it's quite an interesting process where basically you could take a polymer of some kind and extrude it out through a, a thin nozzle, and it falls down onto uh, a metal surface that's electrified. And as it falls down, this polymer begins to form fibers. And the fibers can be used uh, to create a mat. And these mats are what create this uh, nanomaterial or nanofiber uh, fabric or textile, if you will. So we've seen quite a bit of um, you know, developments in this area, which I think is really going to change the game in terms of how we can use nanomaterials and some pretty good applications, pretty relevant things, uh, specifically for uh, body armor and some of the smart textiles that we'll talk about later on. So uh, coatings, I think, are probably uh, one of the bigger areas of, of the soft surfaces, even more than some of the hard surface applications. Specifically, we've seen a lot of antimicrobial applications. Uh, silver nanoparticles, I think, have always dominated, and they continue to dominate this area. We've also seen um, an increase in the use of titanium dioxide for antimicrobial applications, specifically 
Um, it looks like the two types of bacteria that these are most effective against and that most people are interested in are E. coli and the Staph aureus. Um, when we look at flame retardant superhydrophobic nanocoatings, they have primarily been applied to polyester and cotton fibers. Um, the flame retardant coatings really have been all over the board. Um, we didn't really see a pattern in uh, the use of any particular kind, but the superhydrophobic super hydrophobic uh, coatings uh, primarily turn out to be silica and zinc oxide based, which is very interesting. So um, that's pretty much the trends that we have seen in those areas. When we look at smart textiles and body armor, um, some interesting developments here, it really comes down more into not using nanomaterials to recreate um, whole patches of textiles, but incorporating nanomaterials into existing types of, of fibers and textiles. Um, with the carbon nanotubes and the smart textiles, we've seen those integrated into um, existing fibers such as cotton. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, carbon nanotubes are electrically conductive, so they, they make very good sensors. Uh, body armor, we're looking at soft armor here. There are two types of body armor, basically hard armor, which um, can be ceramic plates and things like that. And then the soft armor, which would be things that would flex more like um, Kevlar or uh, the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fibers. And so um, some interesting research that we have found is that even the addition of just a 4% volume of carbon nanotubes into ceramics can actually improve fracture volume toughness by 94%. Um, and one of the, there was an interesting um, research project that was done, I believe, by the Army Research Lab, where they actually were able to grow zinc nanofibers onto uh, Kevlar. And it, one of the hallmarks of soft body armor is that you need the fibers to flux enough to absorb and dissipate the energy of the projectile, but you don't want those fibers to completely pull apart, right, because the projectile will, will rip through the fabric and that and obviously cause injury. And so with these uh, zinc oxide nanowires, um, they've actually, as the, as the larger fibers begin to pull back, these little nanowires or nanofibers kind of tighten and uh, provide some extra grip. So they, they allow a more dissipation of energy, but still keep the fibers intact, which is quite an interesting development. So the last section of the literature search focus on non-durable goods. And again, these are things that have expiration dates or require a lot of continual maintenance. Um, so we, we categorize these um, at, you know, as their own um, group. So let's talk a little bit about some of the coatings that we put into this group. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with the anti-corrosive applications, we've seen an increased use in epoxy coatings that have been enhanced with zinc nanoparticles. Um, again, I think zinc, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and silver seem to um, kind of play without all of these different areas. Uh, thermal barrier coatings, um, things that are going to you know, protect um, different areas from heat. We've seen uh, nanostructure zirconia-based um, coatings that either enhance existing titania uh, thermal barriers, or they can replace them in some areas. Um, again, the hydrophobic surfaces, we see titanium dioxide and ceria and zinc oxide used in nanostructure patterns. Um, in these particular applications, um, there has to be a continual maintenance of these, these particles, um, but, but very interesting developments in some of these areas. And then finally, with biofouling, um, so we're talking about uh, minimizing the amount of organic material and you know, life that can grow on the bottom of ships and things like that. Um, the use of silver nanoparticles and zinc oxide, which it doesn't seem uncharacteristic at all, which is interesting that this seems to be a trend specifically for the use of biofouling in aquatic environments. Some of the areas where we see these non-durable goods have been in cover and concealment. Obviously, in the defense community, um, camouflage, radar, things like that are of a high strategic value. So for a number of years, uh, carbon black, which is a um, 
microscale, very, very small microscale version of carbon. It hasn't been used in, in uniforms um, to help reduce the near infrared reflectance. And so we, we found some studies where actually multi wall carbon nanotubes are a very good replacement for the carbon black, and they can be used in the uh, desert camouflage pattern. Probably at this point, it might not be cost effective, but um, as the uh, production capacity of uh, carbon nanotubes uh, becomes more efficient, this might be a, a good substitute, which will provide um, you know, a lot better protection. And also, um, in the radar coatings, we've seen an increase in the use of uh, nanoscale or nanostructured hexagonal ferrite uh, for uh, microwave absorption capabilities. And CBRM protection, uh, we've seen carbon nanotubes used. Um, they can be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, the carbon nanotube, since it's sh shaped like a straw, can actually be incorporated vertically uh, to create pores. These pores can be um, basically scaled depending on the width of the carbon nanotube, so you can control what types of uh, materials can get in and out. So this is really good for um, protective suits that need to allow heat and water vapor to um, flow out from a person so that their body temperature doesn't get elevated, but still protect um, the person from chemical warfare agents or possibly biological agents from getting into the suit. Um, we've also seen, and I thought this was very interesting, you don't see niobium very often, but uh, niobium oxide on the nanoscale framework um, was used and, and was quite efficient in uh, breaking down certain uh, chemical agents. So this, this might be an area to watch for those of you on, on the line who are interested in uh, CBR defense. Uh, finally, just the last two things are, are quite interesting. One of the key uses of nanomaterials uh, probably since before 2000 has been in, in lubricants. Um, and we found the use of nanostructure molybdenum compounds um, for improving lubricants, as well as adding nanoscale silver uh, to molybdenum compounds and other types of lubricants to improve the efficiency. And then finally, in the battlefield medicines, and this could be applied to any type of medical applications, but specifically it might improve um, some of the combat medicine, uh, combat casualty care programs out there. But we've seen an increased use in silver and chitosan nanoparticles for hemostasis and wound care. Uh, chitosan is based off of chitin, which is a um, material found in exoskeletons of insects and crustaceans. Uh, it's, it's a very good, um, has very good healing and um, clotting properties. And so there's actually a, a few products commercially available that have chitosan nanoparticles in them. Uh, Hemcon, Tegazorb, and Quick Clot are just a few. So that covers the findings of our literature search. And uh, just a reminder, we will have our state-of-the-art report available for download uh, at the end of the webinar and also uh, sometime tomorrow around this time. So if I went really fast and you, or if you're really interested in digging into some more of these areas, uh, you'll, you'll have that opportunity. Um, so I want to move on now and talk about some of these relevant institutions that we um, evaluated here. So there are about 16 institutions. Many of these were within the Department of Defense. Um, we were hoping that we would be able to find some relatively easy and publicly available information regarding research. Unfortunately, um, we didn't really find all the information that we were hoping, but there are a couple up here that provided um, a good amount of, of research, and, and we uh, summarized some of that here for you. The Naval Research Laboratory within the past few years has a um, wide variety of nanomaterial related research on their website, and these are a few that we picked out uh, specific to um, applications and, and surfaces. Um, so just to kind of reiterate these categories, so in the hard surfaces, we found um, that they have actually developed a better way to use particle atomic layer deposition. It provides a more uniform coating process um, on particles. Um, and then also, if you kind of skip down towards, let's see the third line there on the hard surfaces, uh, using carbon nanotubes to create thin films. Again, they're electrically conductive, and so these are 
um, a nice way to make electrically active coatings out of carbon nanotubes. And then just to cover the soft surfaces real quick, uh, some research suggests that they have developed poly polymer nanofibers for uh, chemical and biological decontamination. Um, there's more specifics in the state-of-the-art report, and we also have the links to all of these different uh, research projects in our state-of-the-art report as well if you want more information. Uh, finally, I just want to talk about some of the research happening in the Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, so the Department of Energy has five uh, nanoscale research centers, um, and this is one that is at Argonne, the Center for Nanoscale Materials. Um, they've done some work looking at graphene and nanodiamonds, and they were actually able to produce um, a very, very good lubricant. Um, and it was very close to zero friction, which I think is very interesting. So uh, most of the carbon-based nanomaterials, in particular, um, we've seen buckyballs. They have been used quite often in lubricants. Um, graphene has a variety of applications. I believe in this one they use graphene flakes. Um, and so that, that's very interesting to get that close to not having any friction at all. It's a, quite an impressive breakthrough. I just briefly want to cover some of the university research um, that we have discovered. And again, these were universities um, that we coordinated with ORU to get their feedback from. Um, there was a lot happening, so I didn't want to cover the slides, so I thought we could just kind of pick out some highlights here. But um, we got some feedback from Duke University, and they are actually um, looking at thin films. Um, this is some research that actually is developed out of a lot of what was originally initiated during World War II. Uh, but looking at ways to minimize reflections off of surfaces, so a lot to do with uh, the cover and concealment that we talked about earlier. Um, skip down to the University of Arkansas. Um, they're doing a lot of, of research in both hard and soft surfaces, um, specifically with different types of textiles, um, backpacks, footwear, body armor, things that would be applicable to Department of Defense. Um, and then with the hard surfaces, looking at antimicrobial um, surfaces or uh, you know reducing microbial activity using a variety of different types of nanomaterials. Um, and one more thing I wanted to mention here, they have done some work looking at different types of lubricants. Um, and this information is available in the state-of-the-art report if you want to read more about that. Just to briefly touch on a few more of these universities, uh, the University of Georgia uh, has done a lot of work in hard surfaces looking at patterns and uh, texture and also some research with um, uh, reducing the near infrared reflectivity. Uh, University of Kentucky um, has done some work looking at um, different types of paint using carbon nanotubes um, that are actually less reflective, um, might have some applications in uh, camouflage and concealment. Um, the rest of this information can be found in the state-of-the-art report. I don't want to read too much of this. Uh, I could drone on and on for days, so I'll let you take your time, and when you get a chance, you can look at that. And again, if you have any questions, we'll have my contact information available at the end. So we'll take a few minutes here to just wrap up everything we discussed. Just as a review, it was a lot of information in a short period of time. Okay, and so just answer a question here real quick. So um, the state-of-the-art report, it looks like we have a chat here. Uh, it will be available on our Facebook and our LinkedIn pages tomorrow afternoon around this time. I think we'll also have a downloadable copy. Um, when we get to the end of the webinar here in a few minutes, we'll also have uh, a download for you. All right, and we have one more question that came in here. Um, second chance, uh, second to read this here. It 
So, okay, that was a really good question. Um, so the question is basically concerning, you know, the use of all these nanomaterials and looking at, um, you know, different publications that might talk about environmental lease and potential impacts. Um, that wasn't, we did come across some of those publications. Uh, we didn't talk about risk in this state of the art report. We were specifically looking at applications. Um, if you'd like to send me an email after the presentation, uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to you some more about this. I've done a lot of work in this area. Um, and, and there's a lot, um, a lot to talk about, and it probably warrants a um, another phone call at another time. But please, uh, please reach out to me, and, and we will definitely talk about environmental impacts. Okay. So feel free if you have more questions to chat. I'm going to go ahead and move on and just uh, kind of summarize some of our thoughts here. So this is just a different way to categorize what I just told you, um, but hopefully this helps. So the most common nanoparticles that we have seen, um, you know, trending over the past year or so has been uh, carbon nanotubes, silver nanoparticles, titanium dioxide, and zinc oxide. And I think you could probably tell from a variety of the different applications we discussed um, that those seem to be some of the most common um, uh, nanomaterials. Specifically in applications, I think the superhydrophobic surfaces, whether it's uh, the use of coatings or whether it's the use of texture to pattern surfaces, has really been one of the key applications that people are using nanomaterials to, to reproduce. I think it's very interesting. Uh, we've got a few minutes here, so I'll just talk a little bit about this in detail. So um, there's a naturally occurring phenomenon that is superhydrophobic. It's called the lotus effect. So lotus lotus leaves is a type of plant, but they have a um, very interesting surface structure. And so when the water hits the surfaces of these lotus leaves, it beads up. And a lot of times it actually, um, as the water falls off, it cleans the lotus flower, the lotus leaf. So it has this uh, self-cleaning effect. So this is what a lot of people are trying to recreate with these super hydrophobic coatings is in, in surfaces, is not only to have something that is water resistant, but also can be self-cleansing. So um, some really interesting applications there. I'm sure you can think of a lot of things if, if anybody goes camping or if you're, uh, you know, working out um, near water all the time or if you're out in the rain and there are things that can't get wet, there might be some really good uses of these types of coatings. Uh, the other big application has been in textiles, um, specifically in the smart textiles or the electronic textiles. Um, a lot of these um, have applications in a variety of, of different ways, but they can be used to uh, track people right for location. They can also be used, um, you can have sensors incorporated into clothing um, to monitor heart rate and things like that. So a lot of different varieties for this. Um, some of the things I just want to talk about, kind of looking at the future, I mentioned that we um, you know, looked at things in the past three years that are possible and kind of where we think things might be going in the very near term, but I want to talk a little bit about the midterm, probably five years or so. Uh, some of the things that we came across I think were interesting. So uh, there, in this report and then also some of the other literature that we have seen um, recently, a huge increase in interest in using biomaterials on the nanoscale to create different types of effects. And in particular, we see chitosan a lot. Uh, we also see aragonite, which comes from uh, seashells and mollusks, and then other types of materials found in the human body, so hydroxyapatite uh, would be one of those, which we mentioned has some orthopedic applications. Uh, some of the other uses um, of nanomaterials that I think is going to be more important is in concrete. Uh, carbon nanotubes and silicon nanoparticles have been incorporated in into concrete in some uh, situations. I think we'll continue to see more of this. We very briefly touched on this in the report, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, this is an area of particular interest when you look at critical infrastructure protection. Um, this might be a way to make the maintenance cycles um, you know, longer and then also um, improve some of the um, water resistance and the wear and tear and things like that. And then finally, I think graphene is one of those things. I think any of us who have done research in nanotechnology for a long time are kind of waiting for this day. But once, once graphene becomes um, commercially viable to be produced on a very large scale for you know, a cost-effective way, I think we're going to see a lot of integration 
into a variety of different applications. Uh, we did mention the graphene flakes that Argon developed that could be used as lubricants. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, for graphene in body armor as well. Um, there's some information in the that report where we did talk about um, the toughness of graphene, actually, and, and how well it does defend against um, uh, projectiles. But also, graphene is um, electrically conductive, so it does have a lot of applications, possibly even in e-textile. So I think it's something um, up and coming that we probably need to keep an eye on. So I would be remiss if I didn't state that I had some help on this. Um, first of all, I want to thank the HDI staff. Everybody uh, helped me out. We had a, an editorial staff that was great. We also had a lot of support from our leadership here and then also from uh, Defense Technical Information Center. So thank you to everybody who helped make this a reality. Also, I want to give a special thanks to my co-authors. I think one of them may be on the phone. So Jason Davis, Dr. Jason Davis at ORU is one of the co-authors. He did uh, most of the research on our non-durable goods section, so I want to thank Jason for all the work that he did. And also David Ransberg uh, with the West Virginia University. I want to thank him for all the work that he did uh, specifically on the hard surfaces um, area. And so if you're keeping tabs, that means that I did the majority of the work on the soft surfaces area. So if you have any questions uh, specifically about soft surfaces, I'm probably the best person to contact. Uh, these other two areas, feel free to contact me if there's more detailed information uh, we can get to. Um, I can get that information to uh, Dr. Davis or to, to Dave Ransberg. And as I promised, uh, here is my direct contact information. I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. We'll have a few minutes here uh, to chat. Uh, but just wanted to say uh, thank you to everybody for taking time out of your day. Please feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I think right now we'll open it up um, to the chat function here. So I'll just talk for a few minutes because I, I really hate dead space. Um, but I encourage anyone, if you do have a question, Please feel free to type it in right now. We'll kind of uh, hang out for a minute or two. If you are shy or can't think of a question that comes to you later, you can contact me directly. Um, I will take a moment to mention some of the ser um, services that we provide at HD Act that may be a benefit to you on the phone. Um, we do have a technical inquiry service. Uh, we do provide up to four free hours of research on a topic as long as it relates to one of our eight focus areas. So if you have a question about nanotechnology from the reports or anything that fits one of our focus areas, feel free to ask us about that. If you have questions that aren't related to nanotechnology that fit within our focus areas, uh, feel free to send those to us. You can go to our website and find a technical inquiry request form, and we will uh, do everything we can to take care of you and answer that question. We also have um, a contracting mechanism called the core analysis task. Um, there are a few caveats with that, but we can work directly with um, funding agencies within any branch of the federal government, any agency, and we have a variety of partners in industry, industry and academic partners we can work with. Um, we can uh, facilitate contracts up to $500,000, and uh, they must be completed within one year. Um, but these are a good way to you know, do some research on a proof of concept idea or maybe something um, that you want to test and see how it works in the field. Um, but definitely, um, if that sounds like something of interest to you, uh, contact me directly or you can go to our website, hdiac.org, and find out more information about our uh, core analysis task as well as our technical inquiry service. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions at the moment. So um, we'll leave this up for a few minutes. Um, and seeing we do have, oh, thank you, uh, James. You're, you're very welcome. Um, we do have the downloadable content available. So we will leave that up here for a few minutes if some of you are still downloading things. We've got the state of the art report available. Uh, Tracy, you're welcome. I'm glad you're able to make it. Um, uh, the one page flyer that talks about HDAC services. We've got um, 
the slides for this webinar, and we also have some other information. Uh, one more thing I do want to mention, uh, we have a quarterly publication, the HDI Journal. If any of you are interested in publishing in that or just getting a copy and seeing what we write about, um, feel free to reach out to us and we can provide more information about that for you. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. I, I always try to talk to people in a way that everybody can understand. Um, I'll, I'll just leave you with some humor here. So Albert Einstein once said, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you probably don't understand it yourself. So I think it's very important, especially when you're communicating uh, highly technical topics to make it accessible to people. I don't want to don't want to hide anything. This is how we, um, you know, facilitate discussion and communications in science. So. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us. And I just want to remind you that we have another um, state of the art report webinar scheduled for April 27th. That one will be conducted by Dr. Ashley Stewart. Uh, she will be talking about the findings of our um, traumatic brain injury and uh, post traumatic stress disorder state of the art, art report. So, if you're interested in that, uh, stay tuned for more information on how to register. So, thank you everybody again, and um, we appreciate your support and your interest. And with that, I'd like to wish you a good day. <laughs>